Indie games over the last 15 years have gone from being a small subculture of video games only played and known of by a tiny fraction of the player base, to becoming more of a genre of games that many players nowadays consider to be a treasure trove of creative ideas and fun gaming experiences. While some of the more well-known titles like Cave Story or Braid were released in the early 2000s in the wake of services like Xbox Live Arcade and Steam to great success, indies have arguably begun becoming generally popular in the early 2010s. One of these games is Guacamelee, a metroidvania game with a very distinct style and atmosphere that has been downloaded over 4 million times since its release in 2013. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Backlog Project, where we play through a gigantic list of games to find out which of them are worth putting onto your backlog. Today, we're checking out Guacamelee, an indie sensation that has captured the hearts of many with its unique presentation and interesting spin on the typical Metroidvania formula. The genre has become much more popular in recent years, with the Metroid series even receiving a completely new main entry. In 2021. So was Guacamelee's success built on its own big, muscle-bound, luchador shoulders of great game design? Or did Dreambox Studios just get lucky with releasing the title at a time when fans of the genre would jump at anything that even dared enter the wrestling arena of competition? Since the game is heavily influenced by Mexican culture and folklore, there will be quite a few Mexican names and terms used in this video. I have absolutely no prior knowledge of the Mexican language, so if any of you do or are in some way native to the language, I apologize for butchering what may be very dear to you. Also, as a little challenge to you guys, write a comment with how many words I pronounced the wrong way in this review and let's see who can find the most. The first thing you see when you boot up the game is a warning that playing with a controller is recommended. Since I play most games with a controller anyways, I'm fine, but I can see how the game would play worse on keyboard and mouse. Super Turbo Championship Edition. The warning fades and you're screamed at with the name of the game by a Smash Bros-like announcer and I love this. It feels kind of retro and also drives home the wrestling theme of the game, which we'll dive into deeper later in the video. You hit start and the screen switches to the main screen where you can start the game, change some general options and see the leaderboards that are completely useless on PC since there's cheaters everywhere and I just can't believe someone played through the game in one second. There's also an extra screen that lets you view already seen cutscenes again but nothing else. The music playing here also sets the tone for what's to come very well. Traditional Mexican mariachi music with a tad of modern synthesizer sounds that makes it feel fitting to the setting, but also stylish and unique. After starting the game, you get thrown right into gameplay. You are Juan, an agave farmer living in a small house outside a village called Puebluco. It's Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. A traditional holiday in Mexico that is celebrated to honor the deceased by building offering altars for them and also just having a lighthearted party. Juan has to help set up for the celebration and is thus awoken by a local priest. I like how the first few seconds of the game already characterize Juan a lot. He sleeps through a very important and social holiday, has old posters of wrestlers, a lot of training equipment and even a shrine dedicated to wrestling in his house. It's obvious he dreams of becoming a luchador, a Mexican freestyle wrestler, but for some reason never made it. He also lives a good way off the actual village, so he's more of a loner, maybe because he's ashamed he never made it to where he wanted to be in life. When you reach the village, Juan's beautiful childhood friend and daughter of El Presidente, Lupita, appears and asks Juan to help her with organizing the festival. Their date is crashed by the evil skeleton Carlos Calaca, who proclaims himself the ruler of the dead world and tries to kidnap Lupita. Juan confronts Calaca to save his beloved and dies in one hit. He wakes up in the world of the dead, where he meets Tostada, guardian of the mask. She tells him he has to put on the mask to fulfill his destiny. So Juan does exactly that and transforms into a luchador, becoming what he always dreamed of. If this sounds like a pretty deep story for a metroidvania, that's because it is. It's not really the focus of the narrative though. The focus is the humor. 
Every character, while well written and comparatively deep, is chock full of gags, one liners, and odd quirks. This also translates into the game world itself. You can't walk for more than a minute without finding some sort of pop culture reference, just as a quick example. New abilities are learned by finding Chuzo statues that couldn't be more reminiscent of Metroid's Chozo statues even if they tried. While the story is good and engaging, what really keeps you coming back and progressing in the game is the fact that you won't play a session of this game without having a good laugh every once in a while. Guacamelee's art style is weird, beautiful, and fitting. It looks a lot like a very high quality cartoon but with heavy Mexican inspiration. The backdrops are gorgeous, special effects make fighting feel like a spectacle, and character animations are funny and endearing. A little detail that makes many screens in the game stand out is the lighting. Sun rays illuminating parts of the screen gives the world a lot of life and make the world feel like an actual world that continues beyond the places you get to explore. As I alluded to when we saw the title screen, the music of the game, composed by Rom DiPrisco and Peter Chapman, is a mix of Mexican-style mariachi music and modern dance floor synth and bass beats that feel like they shouldn't work well together, but they really, really do. Actually, the soundtrack is one of the best things about the game. Even if you're not playing the game, you're bound to find yourself humming some of the catchy tunes to yourself. Whether it's some clean requinto guitar riffs, the punchy strumming of the vihuela, or a perfectly placed ensemble of trumpets, there's something special and interesting about every track, and they get even better by being accompanied by sick bass lines and pumping drum and bass samples. This is a soundtrack you should listen to with some nice pair of headphones that can really bring out the dynamics of these songs. The sound effects really enhance the gameplay here and go along with the cartoon style fighting. Fighting has a lot of swooshes, bangs and other typical cartoon sounds. And since almost every enemy is a skeleton of some kind, there's also a lot of bone cracking and breaking that makes the fight sound meaty and very satisfying to play. When a fight ends, there's also the sound of some kids shouting YAY, which further enhances the whole cartoon idea. Like any good Metroidvania, Guacamelee has a world map with various zones to explore that all feel distinct and make the game world feel organic. However, Every zone is separated, which means not only are there no transitionary biomes, but changing the zone also comes with a loading screen, which isn't deal-breaking, but other Metroidvania games have solved more gracefully. Some of these zones are rather big, but overall the game's world is on the smaller side and in turn rather short. A full 100% run of the game took me around 10 hours. There's 11 Chuzo statues in the game, with each of them granting Juan a new ability, either for fighting or for utility. These range from your typical double jump and ground stomp, all the way to the ability to run up on walls, just to name a few, so I don't spoil the coolest ones. The fighting abilities are color-coded, which will come into play again later in the combat section of the review, but this is also important for exploration. When you start the game, and maybe already when seeing the footage of this video, you will quickly start to notice colored blocks all over the world. These are all colored like one of the various fighting abilities you learn on your journey and can be destroyed by hitting them with the corresponding one, which in turn opens up new paths that are either guiding you to a new collectible or are mandatory for story progression. So, where in other games of the genre you get new items to reach new places, in Guacamelee you hit things. Which brings us to the topic of combat. Not only is the exploration of the game heavily hitting focused, but so is the combat. That isn't really surprising as the main thematic of the game is luchador wrestling, but they really went above and beyond in designing the combat for this game to be in tune with the theme. It's essentially a 2D beat-em-up with some quirks and thus provides an unusually deep combat system for a metroidvania game. Obviously, you can hit stuff with normal attacks and the techniques you learn, but you can also dodge, which makes you invulnerable to attacks. There are some enemies that only become attackable when you directly dodge one of their attacks. Now, what was that about color coding? 
Later in the game, enemies come equipped with shields, and these shields have colors corresponding to your battle moves. Get the idea? It's actually rather simple. You hit them with the color their shield is, and the shield gets depleted, thus making them vulnerable to your attacks. This is made a little more complicated by most enemies having multiple shields with different colors that also recharge after a few seconds. Your goal here is to pull up combos of different colors in a specific order to deplete their shields and then beat the skeletons to death in death with your normal combat moves. Apart from hitting, you can also grab enemies after they take some damage to either use wrestling moves like pile drivers or to throw them around the screen and into other enemies which in turn damages them and their allies. All of this makes for a very engaging and fast combat system that makes fights feel like a combination of classic beat-em-up fun and little puzzles and it makes you always look forward to the next one. While you can beat the game in a few hours by just following the main plot, games of this genre shine in exploring every bit of the world and finding all hidden treasures and goodies. The game might be on the shorter side, but there are still lots of things to find in every area, and some of them are actually pretty well hidden and require a lot of smart movement to find. The game also features an area called the Proving Grounds that is basically a gauntlet of multiple fights on a timer, and another area I won't name for spoiler reasons that features 17 separate challenges that range from fights under certain conditions to platforming challenges like time trials. The game's general gameplay interface is about as simple as it can get. You have your HP bar, your stamina bar, and the intenso bar. When fighting, there is a combo counter on the left side of the screen that rates your maximum combo in a Devil May Cry-ish style. The menu interface is simple to understand and nothing really stands out as either great or bad. There's a fighting game style move list in the menu that you can check if you forget how to pull off certain attacks you've learned and as is standard for metroidvanias, there's a map. The map is actually a really important part of a metroidvania because you will use it a lot to not only find out where to go next but also to find potential treasures you missed or can now access when getting a new ability. It shows you for how long you've played and which collectibles you have found in which zone. A nice little touch is a golden emblem on each zone you have completed, so you know where to search next. The zone maps fill themselves out when traversing them, which in turn gives you little hints as to where new stuff might be if a part of the map is still blacked out. The map does its job, but it could be a little more specific at times. There also isn't any sort of upgrade or unlockable that shows you missing chests and collectibles like a lot of other metroidvanias do. You'll have to decide for yourself if this is good or bad. Personally, I think having the option never hurts since you can just not use it, but the zones are well enough designed that this isn't an issue in this particular case. Controls are simple, tight and entirely customizable. You jump with A, hit with B, grab with Y, dodge with the shoulder buttons and move with either the stick or the control pad. Some advanced moves are pulled off with other buttons and combinations and everything feels purposeful and usable. Juan also moves very fluently and translates your inputs instantly into actions, so combat as well as exploration always feel fast and fluid. Besides abilities to collect, there's treasure chests all over the game that contain either money or upgrades to your health and stamina. These work similarly to hard pieces in the Zelda series, where you get one upgrade for every few of these you collect. Money also comes from battling and is used in shops for buying either these upgrades, new battle moves or new outfits for Juan. Outfits aren't just cosmetic though, as they give you advantages and disadvantages in the game depending on which you are wearing. If, for example, you wear the piñata costume, you earn more money, but take equally more damage, so it cuts down on grinding, but also makes the game harder. These are useful perks that change up your style of play quite a bit, hence also offering some replay value to the game. You might have noticed that I spoke about an intenso bar earlier. This is similar to special meters in fighting games, it fills up as you fight and you can use it to activate a mode that makes you deal more damage and take less, draining the bar while active. 
There's also upgrades to this that allow you to break any shields while Intenso is up, so this is super useful but also kind of overpowered. One thing I haven't talked about yet is the world of the dead. Not only is it a place from Mexican culture that you can explore in the game, one actually gets the ability to switch between both worlds with a click of a button relatively early in the game. This is used in platforming a lot, having some obstacles or platforms only physically appearing in one of the worlds, thus having you switch worlds mid-jump to land on a platform that wasn't there before, among many examples. It's also used in combat with enemies being present and attackable in only one of the two worlds but Juan being vulnerable in both, so you're constantly switching worlds to keep enemies from ganging up on you. You might have noticed me say how the game is enjoyable and fun to play a few times throughout this video. I did this on purpose because that is the message that really needs to come across when reviewing this game. Guacamele certainly isn't for everyone. The art style, music and general theme of the game are very unique and highly specific, so even though I think they are amazing, I can see some people being put off by them. Mixing a few genres to create the combat and gameplay loop was also a bold choice that won't appeal to every gamer out there, but it pulls that mix up very well, and you're sure to have a lot of fun bashing skulls and suplexing undead plants once you give it a try. If you like what you saw and heard in this review, you can put this on your backlog without any worries, as you're sure to get a ton of enjoyment out of it. Maybe even check some of your digital collections. The game has been part of PlayStation Plus and other similar deals, as well as quite a few humble bundles over the years, so chances are you own it on the platform already. If not, or if you're unsure about giving the game a try, you can also wait for one of the rather frequent sales that often see the game going for less than 5 bucks, which really is a steal for a game this unique, polished and just pure fun. And fun is, and will always be, the most important aspect of any game. Alright guys, that's it for this week's episode of the Backlog Project. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and check out our other videos on the channel to see if there's anything missing on your backlog. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you guys next week.